Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is John Abdul Malik. Um, I've been on Chrome for about 12 years, here to talk about the internals of Chrome. Um, my kind of purpose of this talk is to give a background of why you know, see the various layers in the code. Why is all this complexity there? Um, a colleague was able to figure out the number of lines of code. And when we launched, there was about two and a half million lines of code. Today, it's 25 million. So it's a huge increase in complexity. And you'd be looking through it uh, for the engineers and be like, why is it like this? Why are there so many layers? So I'm hoping to give a background about why that's the case. So I'm going to start by giving an overview of why of Chrome's unique architecture and why it was built to support the four S's. Uh, you've heard about these, I'm guessing, already multiple times, right? Speed, security, stability, and simplicity. You're going to hear about them many times, right? If it feels repetitive, it's because really they're central to everything that we do. Um, every time we're trying to figure out how something should be implemented, what the user interface should look like, these are the kind of the principles that drive our thinking. I'm then going to talk about the past, current, and future improvements we've made to the code base and the architecture of Chrome. So, okay. So, what did things look like before Chrome? Um, everything ran in the same process: the networking, the UI, the rendering engine, the plugins, um, image decoding, and so on. And actually, most of these things ran on the same thread. And this was obviously not ideal, right? Um, because if one tab stopped working or crashed, it would take down all the other tabs in the browser itself. And if you remember those days, that's like when you would be writing a big email and then your know, browser would crash and you'd lose it and you have to start all over again, right? So this kind of was not great. But of course, a lot of apps were written that way um, that at the time, right? This is before most users had like multi-core uh, CPUs and so on. But how did Chrome look like when we launched? So this is kind of what it looked like you know, in, in Chrome 1.0. There were multiple processes. Each of these is denoted by like a box. Um, some of them are sandbox. I'll talk more about that later. And that's the red line. And they talk to each other through these dotted lines, which is IPC. Um, this is a huge improvement from the status quo. We moved the code that we control and which operates on untrusted data from the internet into these processes that we kind of limit kind of a damage they can do to your system. There are multiple of these processes. So if one tab you know, went down, it wouldn't take down the other tabs. And then there were plugins that weren't under our control. So we still had to run multiple processes for these, unsandboxed. Um, this is a different way of looking at our multi-process architecture to see which parts or which processes draw which parts of the UI. So the tab strip at the top, is drawn by the browser process, the main process. Um, the, the HTML is rendered by the render processes, and the plugin processes were used to draw like videos, like Flash. So why did we do a multi-process architecture? Kind of like everything in engineering, there's a trade-off, right? So multiple processes, that's going to have some memory overhead, right? It's there's some complexity in, in being able to pass all this data back and forth efficiently. There's, there's obviously going to be some performance overhead in some cases. And the main reason is you just couldn't write perfect code, right? There's always going to be bugs in the code that we write and in all the various third-party libraries that we consume. Um, and so because of these bugs, you could have security issues. Um, there are, you know, sorry, I'm just checking with the notes. Okay. Yeah, so there could be security issues. They, um, bugs could be used to exploit. Um, it could be used for exploits to be able to escape, um, like the sandbox. Um, you could have speed problems, right? If there's buggy code that has like bad algorithm, or there's poorly written HTML pages or JavaScript in your in your site, not even you know code that you control, maybe things that you pulled in through various libraries, that could cause like the you know the browser to be hung. Um, another reason is stability. We wanted to make sure that if a tab crashes, it doesn't break down the whole browser or other tabs. So multi-process is kind of sometimes like a like a silver bullet for all this stuff. It helps in security and stability and, and uh, speed. I mentioned IPC earlier. Um, that stands for inter-process communication. And it's how all these processes talk to each other. Uh, generally, we use message passing and um, 
for any large data we use shared, shared memory. This is usually between processes of different privileges. So every time you cross this IPC layer, you're going to have to go through a security review just to make sure that you know, there aren't any ways for a less privileged process to take over a more privileged process. Usually this is asynchronous communication. Um, there are ways of doing synchronous communication, but we heavily discourage that because of performance overhead. Sandboxing is something I mentioned earlier. Um, since untrusted data can be used to you know, exploit bugs and, and execute code on your system, um, we need to kind of guard against that. And in the beginning, you know, the rendering engines were pretty simple, right? Because it was just rendering. But as we move to web apps and more complicated um, co uh, engines, browser engines, or rendering engines to support that, there's a lot of extra vectors to exploit your system. So we moved this, all this code that operates on untrusted data into processes that are sandboxed, which means it doesn't have access to your file system, um, to make operating system calls, and so on. And then this kind of improves the security. And the exact mechanism to do this is very platform specific. So we've got sandboxing code that's specific on Android and on Mac and Windows. Um, and we often work with OS vendors to kind of add new capabilities to further lock down these sandboxes. And sometimes there are also multiple levels of sandboxing um, depending on the process type. So the main kind of thing that runs all your web content is a render process. Um, this is where you handle data from the web, and we do things like uh, parsing of the HTML, doing layout, executing JavaScript, decoding images and videos and audio and so on. Uh, it's completely sandboxed, so this is the most locked down process in the browser. Another uh, process type that we launched was with plugins. Um, so when we launched, it was a secret project, so we couldn't kind of tell anyone else we were working on it. And this means that at launch, we had to support all these plugins that users uh, or the web content depended on at that time, right? Things like Flash and Java and Adobe Reader. Um, if you didn't support them, then you know, a lot of the web content wouldn't render. Um, so we figured out how to get this working in multiprocess, which was, you know, this was never how they were intended to run. Um, but at the same time, we had to make them run on sandbox because this is third-party code that was kind of written with the assumption that it has full access to your machine. And the, lastly, the browser process is kind of like the center coordinator. Um, it owns a browser state, like your profile data and your settings. It draws like the UI around the content area, and it handles networking. And if, since it's the most trusted, it can't trust all the other processes because they could be trying to lie to it. Um, generally, in most processes, there's at least one main thread and an IPC thread. Um, there are also many other process, uh, threads in the browser process for things like databases or just helper um, threads, so you can offload expensive work from the main threads. Um, the main threads in the browser process are the UI thread, which is the main thread. That's where all the user interface code runs and a lot of the logic. Then there's a very poorly named thread that's called the I.O. thread. But you can kind of, every time you see I.O., just think non-blocking I.O., because that's never where we'll do things like disk access or any expensive operations. And so kind of what I talked about before is how we launched. And you know, how does Chrome look like today? We've done a lot of improvements. Um, you can see we added a bunch of more process types. There's a GPU, which is partly sandboxed, uh, the utility process, extension process. Um, plugins have now a red border, which means they're sandboxed. And the render, instead of running WebKit, it's this new thing, which is Blink, that we forked from WebKit. I'm going to talk more about these in, in the next slides. So what is the GPU process? Well, one thing we observed was that kind of machines um, with powerful GPUs were becoming widespread. But at the same time, um, there were new web platform features like WebGL, which to render in our old architecture means we'd have to do expensive readback. So that wasn't good for performance. So this was a very large project um, to offload compositing and scrolling onto the GPU hardware. Improves performance and power consumption. Um, and it also, um, to do this properly, you know, there were a lot of buggy GPU drivers. So we couldn't just run this code in the browser process because then these bugs in the drivers could be used to exploit or cra cause crashes. So this also runs in a separate process. 
that's partially sandboxed. Um, utility process is a new process that we use kind of for short-lived work. And as a browser gain more capabilities like extensions or you know, there's like JSON headers that come in various API calls and we didn't trust our JSON parser. So we wanted to run that in a separate process that we could sandbox We take the data, right? Can kind of do some operation on it, return the response and then kind of kill itself. Um, so that's, that's that process. And then extensions. So when we launched, we didn't have extension support. We're just trying to scope down the kind of like the problem that the massive problem of launching a new browser. But we always knew that we needed extension support because there's so many things that we'd want to do in a browser um, that different users would want, and we couldn't possibly implement all of that ourselves. So extensions allow kind of users to customize it without bloating the product for everyone. But at the same time, we wanted to learn from kind of issues we saw in other extension implementations. We didn't want a bad extension to be able to slow down your browser or, or you know, the tab. We didn't want a bad extension to be able to have full access to the JavaScript state. In um, and we also didn't want you to have to restart your browser every time you added or removed an extension. So extension kind of processes allowed us to have a lot of the separation um, in terms of kind of restartability and performance and security. The next thing is Pepper plugins. So kind of as Chrome was a new browser, it had different code base than a lot of other browsers. And also had a sandbox. But our kind of weak point was MPPI plugins. And it turned out, right, having the same binary being loaded in all, in all different browsers was a very convenient way to write you know, cross-browser exploits. Um, and we were getting a lot of the issues we were having were with kind of code that we didn't control from third parties. So this was a multi-year effort um, to be able to create a new API to replace you know, the 20-year-old plus um, or the 15-year-old plus API, NP API, with something that's much better that could be sandboxed. Uh, we ported the Flash code base and we worked closely with Adobe to get the code and, and make it be able to run in a sandbox process. And then for PDF, we created a new plugin uh, based on you know, PDF uh, rendering engine that we licensed on the third party. This was like a huge improvement for security. Um, another large kind of re-architecture of Chrome happened with the Chrome content split. Originally, we started this to improve the code layering and testability of our code. We split the browser, like the, the product part of the browser, which is Chrome, from the platform. And the platform, we kind of defined as the, the code to be able to run the, a sandbox, multi-process, or platform engine. And so we kept the product code in source Chrome and created a new directory called source content. And that's where we put the low level kind of code. Um, the higher level code were things like bookmarks, extensions, password manager, autofill, and that stayed in source Chrome. And everything else kind of moved to content. Um, and the neat thing about this is originally we did this just as a way to improve our own developer productivity. But then there were a lot of external and internal products that came that came about as a result. So we're able to run Android WebView uh, built on top of content. We were able to ship uh, Chromecast and Google Home on top of this platform. And then outside, there are things like Electron uh, that were built on top of this as well. Another large kind of multi-year re-architecture was componentization. And that came about because we wanted to develop a browser on iOS. But on iOS, you have to use the browser engine from that's provided by the system, and we couldn't use Blink. So all the code that we had for things like Password Manager and Autofill depended on, on hooks inside Blink. So we separated that um, into from source Chrome into source components, and we isolated the parts on top of Blink so that we could replace it with parts that work on iOS. Um, and that's kind of why you'll see a lot of these layered components and source components. Then another massive effort, this was about a five-year effort, um, was to improve security. And so originally, like Chrome's sandbox was great because a lot of your files were, were on the system. And so if you could prevent uh, malicious content, let's say, from reading your documents directory, that was a big, big improvement. But you know, as, as more of your data moves online or moved online, actually, I don't personally care about, you know, an exploit reaching my file system. What I really care is they don't have access to my drive files or my photos and so on. And so 
But if everything's running in one render process, you couldn't really, like a page could just lie and say, okay, I've got a Google iframe. Now give me all the you know Google cookies and, and so on to be able to pass these cookies to other sites or be able to kind of make requests to other servers and, and feed them all your data. And so this was a massive effort, and, but to split the page. So instead of just running you know, each tab in a separate process, you'd be able to run parts of the tab in different processes, depending on the origin. Um, and the neat thing is, you know, this was started because, you know, we had people like Charlie and NASCO kind of could see that this was a very nice security improvement. But before it was even launched, there was these new processor bugs that came about, like, I think last year or two years ago. And so it was like perfect timing that we could ship this and work around these security bugs and processors. Um, and this was definitely like the biggest security improvement and, and biggest free architecture in Chrome since we launched. Another new thing that we did is Mojo, which is our new IPC uh, system. Uh, Ken and Oksana will talk about this more later today, later in the afternoon, but I just wanted to give you a high-level overview. Um, this is IDL-based, which was different than our old system. It solves a lot of the issues we had with our kind of macro-based approach. Um, it was hard before to send platform handles, like shared memory. You had to have special code. You had to have special code depending on you know, where the caller and the callee run. And if you wanted to move something to a different process, you'd have to kind of have different code tasks. Um, we couldn't send IPCs directly from Blink. So you had to have all these kind of busy work layers of just converting one type to another. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the issues that we faced. Now the new system kind of solves that automatically. And we have a few kind of different primitives that are used uh, as part of Mojo. There are message pipes, which are bi-directional. The nice thing about them is they're really, really cheap. So you, there are no like OS primitives you know, created for each one. They all kind of are uh, run together. Um, there's also shared buffers or you know, shared memory. There are data pipes, which are kind of like shared, shared memory, but with notifications. And everything is processed and thread agnostic. So you could have any of these objects, use them on one thread, pass them on to another thread or to a different process, and everything works automatically. Um, you can kind of use them for a little bit and then pass it off to someone else who can then reuse them. So it's really powerful and we'll be able to use a lot of that uh, to simplify the code and I'll talk more about that in the next slides. So what does the future Chrome look like? Well, I mean, Chrome has moved to, to so many new platforms and products that we could never have kind of um, forecasted when we started writing the code. So kind of step back and try to figure out, okay, how do we really want to re-architect the code so that it's more easy to reuse? So when we have new use cases, you know, if it's headless um, or if it's running without, um, you know, all the other code, if it wants to run just a simplified version, how do we make that possible? And the solution to this was to, to turn a lot of the core code into microservices. Um, microservices are, are kind of have a well-defined API. They're reusable, so you can kind of, you can take pieces and run them in different scenarios. Um, services are, cup, are decoupled from each other, so you could run a subset of them at a time. And it's also built in a layered way. So you could kind of build like a file system uh, service and then take that and reuse it to build a, a level DB uh, service as well. Some of the benefits we wanted to achieve from this is, is speed. We wanted to have fewer conversions, so you could run the subsystems closer to the call sites. Uh, we wanted to be able to split code into services that could be sandboxed, and that improves stability um, because if it crashes, it doesn't take down the browser. It also improves security because we could sandbox that new process type. And then also simplicity. I'm kind of overriding simplicity, that word, because usually we use that you know, for the user interface, but here I'm talking about uh, simplicity from a developer's point of view. Um, if you could reduce boundaries, uh, if you can have way you know, fewer um, methods of doing the same thing instead of doing networking differently in the browser process and the render process and the utility process, like maybe it should be the exact same API that you use from everywhere. And this is like a, to go back to my earlier diagrams about the process models, this is one kind of um, way that we could run the browser with this, with microservices. So you could see we move networking and storage into different processes um, and they're sandbox, which is a big improvement. It's also like a UI service or device service. 
Um, and that's if you have a lot of memory, so you don't may not care about the small overhead of each process. But then on mobile, when you have um, kind of much more constrained devices, with a flip, with like a one-line if statement, you can suddenly decide, okay, I'm going to run these services together in the same process. Um, and that's, for example, code, that's something that we do already today. Another benefit um, is you can just say, well, I'm not going to run all the browser code. Let's say the user closed the browser, but there's a you know pending download. Instead of keeping the browser open, or it could be killed by the user or the system because we're not resources, we can just run a small subset, just a networking code, just a storage code, and that will be like kind of a lot more likely to run to completion. So a lot of that is, is kind of benefits that we get from module. It gives us so much flexibility that we can kind of do these new use cases. And then lastly, I'm going to just go over a quick overview of the, of the directory structure to kind of tie all the previous things I talked about. So base is where you're going to find like the file, the string utilities, and so on. Chrome is our product uh, on desktop and mobile. Other than iOS, that is in source iOS. Uh, components is where we move the layered components that are shared with uh, desktop and iOS. Uh, content is like our low-level web platform engine. Um, net is our low-level networking library. Uh, services is where microservices go. And then Blink is our rendering engine. Uh, UI is where we put like the frameworks we use to create the browser UI. These are things outside of the content area. And V8 is our JavaScript engine.